Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, John, for that introduction, but more importantly, for the tremendous work that you have done for so many years, uh, both uh, to build up uh, this fantastic organization, the Center for American Progress, and to ensure that progressive values uh, are shared more and more widely throughout our country. Uh, also, uh, thank you for getting it right. You know, sometimes these days I feel like I need a name tag. Uh, my brother Joaquin, I see him these days more on CNN and MSNBC than I do in real life. Uh, I want to thank Nira and the staff of CAP as well as the board. This is a fantastic conference. This must be, I imagine, one of the most successful ones that they've had, and congratulations on that. And also to each and every one of you, uh, who I know either here in D.C. or in your own communities, do great work to serve Americans of all different backgrounds uh, in every corner of our nation. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for the difference that it makes in those communities and to our nation as a whole. Uh, I bring you greetings from the great state of Texas uh, and also from my brother. Um, as most of y'all know, we're twins, um, but he's in Congress, so you know what that means. I'm the only one that's actually working today. Uh, you know, a few days ago, and y'all may have seen this, I saw a story about a young woman named Jasmine Harrison from Greensboro, North Carolina. Jasmine was in the news because she had, she's a high school senior, and she had applied and gotten in to 113 different colleges and gotten $4.5 million in scholarship money. Jasmine's story caught my eye because a few weeks earlier, I saw the story of somebody from my home state of Texas, uh, a high school senior named Michael Brown. Michael goes to school in, in the Houston Independent School District, a high school named Lamar, and he was raised by a single parent, a young black man, uh, applied to the 20 best universities in the country and got into all 20 and he got a full ride scholarship to each and every one of those universities. I saw that and I thought, this is how America is supposed to work. I was even happier about a week ago when I saw that out of those schools that Michael had chosen to go to Stanford. There you go. Uh, it reminded me 25 years ago of the opportunity that my brother and I had. You know, we'd grown up on the west side of San Antonio with my mother and my grandmother. My grandmother had come from Mexico when she was about six or seven years old in 1922 with her younger sister because their parents passed away and the nearest relatives they had lived in San Antonio. They brought her to San Antonio but took her out of school so she never finished elementary school and she ended up working as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter because of that. She raised my mother as a single parent, and my mother was the first one to actually finish high school and then have the chance to go to college. And I remember on April 3rd, 1992, running out to the mailbox of our house with Joaquin, because we had been applying to college, and finding these two packets in the mailbox. Now, y'all remember that when you apply to college, you wanted to get a packet back and not a letter, because if you got a letter, it was probably a thank you, but no thank you. We ran back into the house and opened up the packets, and the letter inside said, congratulations, and welcome to the Stanford class of 1996. And I wish that I had had back then one of the cell phone cameras that all of us have today so that I could have taken a picture of my grandmother's face because she never could have believed that that kind of opportunity was possible for herself, for my mom, or even for us. We'd gone to the public schools of San Antonio, gotten fee waivers to apply to these colleges, Everybody was so happy. It was one of those moments that I'm sure everybody in this room has had in your life. 
where you feel like you're reaching your dreams or you're well on your way. Like things are going to be better in your life. And I could see that she saw that. And then a couple of weeks later, we got the bill. And that wasn't such a happy day. At the time, Stanford cost between twenty-seven dollars and $28,000 per person per year. And my mother had made around nineteen dollars or $20,000 that year that we applied. And my grandmother was getting a few hundred dollars in a Social Security check. And so there was no way that these two women that had worked hard their entire lives could afford that opportunity for us. And the only reason that I can stand here blessed with the opportunity that I've had, the education that I've gotten, is because I worked hard and my family worked hard, but also because there were Pell Grants and Perkins loans, and there was federal work study so that we could work when we were in college. Because we invested in ourselves, but America also invested in us. And I believe that that's when this country has been at its greatest, when we have matched that hard work with meaningful opportunity. And the thing is that in this 21st century, we need that recipe for success in our country more than ever before. Five years ago, I was in Chennai, India, because Chennai is one of San Antonio's sister cities. I was serving as a mayor at the time, and I visited on Republic Day. And as we watched this parade of national pride go by, one of the government officials there told me that in the state of Tamil Nadu alone, there were more than 400 different engineering programs. Today, this country, our nation, is competing and collaborating with nations around the world that are rising and producing tons and tons of young people with the talent, the ability, the creativity, the drive to create the companies and the ideas that are going to drive prosperity in the years to come. In this world in which brain power truly is a new currency of success, it means that for the United States, we don't have a single person to waste. We need everyone's talent to succeed. The thing is, today, too many Americans never get the chance to live up to their potential because our nation is failing them. You see, if we want more success stories like Michael Brown of Houston, then we can't forget about, about young Michael Brown of Ferguson, Missouri. Michael Brown, who was 18. Michael, who had just graduated from high school. Michael, who was on his way to college to study heating and air conditioning repair. Michael, who was gunned down and killed, unarmed, at the hands of law enforcement. Michael, who would have turned 22 next Sunday. As Secretary of HUD, I traveled to 100 different communities across 39 states. In Ferguson, I learned that a child growing up in the upscale Clayton area of St. Louis can expect to live 18 years longer than a child growing up eight miles across town in the Jeff Vanderloo neighborhood. At Pine Ridge, I visited a small home where 18 people lived, including two families that lived, that slept on a dirt floor basement their room separated by a bed sheet that they had strung up across the basement. And so whether a young man or a young woman is from Ferguson or from Pine Ridge, lives in Philadelphia or in Youngstown, no matter the color of their skin or how much money their family makes or how long they've been here in our country, 
What they need from us is a positive, inclusive vision for the future, a 21st century blueprint for opportunity that makes the investments that we need today, not yesterday, as our nation confronts the challenge of growing automation and growing competition from impressive countries around the world, we need a new blueprint. It means making universal pre-K a reality so that every single child can get a great start in life. It means making at least the first two years of college free. Because just as we used to think about high school as a requirement, today we need to think about certification or at least an associate's degree as a requirement to succeed in this 21st century global economy. It means raising the minimum wage because even though productivity has skyrocketed over the last four decades, pay has not. It means finally making healthcare truly universal so that the United States is not the last industrialized country to do so. And it means unleashing the potential of 800,000 dreamers by passing a Clean Dream Act and then getting on to comprehensive immigration reform. It means reforming our policing and stopping the brutalization of young black men in our country. And yes, it means fair housing, making sure that no matter where one lives, that they can afford to have a safe and decent place to rest their head. You know, I bet that over the years, the folks in this room have also had the opportunity to walk into a classroom of elementary school students on career day. And uh, I have to tell you that there's nothing quite like walking into a second grade classroom it's like watching a group of folks who just had three Red Bulls let loose, <laughs> like a beehive of activity. When I visit with them, I always ask them a straightforward question that all of us ask, which is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you all know that the first thing that happens is that their hands fly up into the air. People say they want to be a doctor, or they want to be a lawyer, they want to be a firefighter or a teacher. They want to be LeBron James or Gabby Douglas. And when they do that, you can see in their eyes that they know at that age that they're going to accomplish their dream. I wanted to come here today to thank you all for everything that you were doing to help them do that. Everything that you're doing to make our nation stronger and fairer, more inclusive, and thereby more prosperous. I also want to challenge you to redouble your efforts. In the face of so many efforts trying to take our nation backward to a time before our civil rights movement, trying to pick and choose who gets opportunity in our country and who doesn't. Essentially trying to roll back the hands of time. I hope that today's conference is a great chance for you to network, to share ideas, and also in a very meaningful way to reflect for a moment on why it is that you do what you do because you know that we do live in the greatest nation on earth. You know that you too have been blessed with tremendous opportunity in this country. You know that everyone counts. You also know that through your efforts, through your advocacy, through your vision, with your voice, that you can help make sure that when those hands fly up in those classrooms, 
that those dreams come true in this 21st century. Thank you very much.